bir kere hani bütün bu şey boyunca defalarca söylendi ama ben de bir kere daha söylemeden edemeyeceğim. Gerçekten bu muhteşem program için emeği geçen herkese teşekkür ediyoruz. Çok geniş, günlerce süren, çok kapsamlı bir karşılaşmayı bizim için mümkün kıldıklarından. Bir de ben bu yani etkinlikte daha başlığı görünce dahi şunu düşündüm. Türkiye'nin uzun bir batılılaşma tarihi var. İsveç'te çok batıyı çok temsil eden bir yerdir zihnimizde. Ee, bu iki dünyayı bir araya getirmek fikri başlı başına çok büyüleyici. Ee, ve bu karşılaşmadan da hani çok ben çoğuna kat, yani bazılarına katılabildim etkinliklerin ama çok şey öğrendim. Ee, şimdi bana biraz da zor bir görev düşecek çünkü hiç tanımadığım bir edebiyat üzerine <gülüyor> yazarları tanıtmaya çalışacağım. Ee, bir parça işte İngilizce kısa öykülerini okuduğunuzu inanın. Ve okuduğum kadarından bile çok yani bu şuraya çok ince ve güzel öykülerdi. Ee, elimden geleni yapacağım. Ee, önce bir e, katılımcılarımızı kısaca tanıtmak istiyorum. Ee, sonra kendi küçük konuşmaları var. Arkasından da hani ben soracağım, cevaplayacaklar. Bak vakit kalırsa sizin sorulara da e, yer vereceğiz. Zilla Norman, 1960 doğumlu, hem bir yazar hem bir gazeteci. İlk adamını yazarlar 1995'te atıyor. 10 tane yetişkinler için, 4 tane de genç okurlar için roman yazıyor. Ve bu romanlarıyla da sayısız, yani çok sayıda diyelim, ödül almış bir yazar. Helena von Zweigwerdse, ee, e, bir romancı, gazeteci ve radyo programcısı. Ee, kurguları genellikle çağdaş ailenin dramı şeklini alsa da kadın, kadın hapishanesinde çalışan bir din görevlisi hakkında bir suç dizisi de kaleme almış. Ee, bizim zaten herhalde hani Kuzey Edebiyatı'yla e, en fazla tanışıklığımız Kuzey dizileri, yani anlatısıyla en azından edebiyat demeyelim, Kuzey dizileri üzerinden. Ee, Amazon yazarın e, Amazon yazarın bir anneyle üç yetişkin kızı hakkındaki son romanı The Heart Echoes'un e, dünya çapındaki yayın hakları satın almış. O zamandan bu yana da yazar yaşlı bir kadın ile yetişkin kızın ilişkisini anlatan The Ones They Meet isimli kısa bir roman kaleme almış. E, bunların yanı sıra da ünlü bir e, İsveçli müzik grubunun vokalisti ile ilgili bir biyografi yazmış. Şimdi ben sözü onlara bırakmak istiyorum konuşmaları için. Tekrar teşekkür ederiz. Okay. Um... Hello and good night uh, and um, I would like to say that I'm very happy to be here in Istanbul and I'm very grateful to be invited to this festival and um, I'm going to talk about um, my books and my my writing and especially um, writing um, with the issues of motherhood so I d debuted as a fiction author in 1995 and I have since then written 10 novels but also four books for young adults and a couple of scripts for film. Essentially, I, all I have written is about close relationships and almost every one of them have in some way touched the family and their mutual lives and special relationships. I often get the question why the family became my big subject and my answer is that I had no choice. The family seems to me to be an endless source of stories about me but also about everyone else. And as the great strong middle point in this family there is always a mother. We are all born by a mother whether we have lived with her or not, she is there. Whether we like her or not, she is there. She is standing in the middle of the family. And 
motherhood is also a, re a relationship that we all have, regardless of sex, religion, age, ethnicity, and place on earth. It is an eternal relation that never ends. We all come from a mother, and therefore we have a constant relationship with her. And similarly, a mother has a motherhood, whether she wants it or not. But even though the mother is so central, maternity is a relationship usually taken for granted. It is, many ways a it is in many ways a quiet relation. Therefore, it is constantly present and interesting for me in my writing. I started writing my first novel when I got my first child. I was a journalist at a big daily newspaper in Stockholm by that time and had a great longing for finding another way of expressing what I wanted to write about and speak about and think about. My newborn daughter was extremely longing for and loved. After many miscarriage, I, I and my husband had the fortune to adopt her from Colombia. And a couple of years after her birth, we received a son and then another son from the same institution in Bogota. So, with three adopted children and three grandchildren, motherhood has become a relationship with many perspectives for me, from the most close and intimate to the big global context. But what can a mother actually write? What can a female author write about motherhood? There is always a huge risk that she is regarded as an autobiographical writer. And in maternity, there is a silent obligation to protect and not betray the child. I think this is the reason why there are so few stories about maternity in the global literature. The connection between authors and readers, between reality and fiction, and between truth, lies and memories are typical subjects for authors all over the world. Most of us can speak forever about those issues. As both a writer and a reader, it is always interesting to ask if you can accuse a memory of lies and if anyone's life story can be used in a novel. There are some more or less unspoken rules for what an author may and may not write about. In democracies, most people claim the right to write almost everything for example, everything about their parents. The global literature is full of family stories. But in these stories, it is almost always an author who uses his memory and goes back through it to investigate the childhood and the parents. But turning the time around and being the parent who writes about an own child, you should not do it. It is taboo. So, I ask the question again. Can a mother actually write about motherhood? One of the writers I often return to is Marguerite Duras. Her high voltage complexity has always fascinated me, and some of her books I read over and over again. She was a mother, and she also wrote a lot of being a daughter. And a lot about her own writing, where she often recovered a statement that has come to mean a lot to me in my work as well. She says, Writing is the longing to say everything at the same time. I say it once again. 
writing is the longing to say everything at the same time. What does it mean? To me, it is a kind of faithful explanation of how complicated and worrying and often painful the actual writing is. How to start saying this everything. A novel is not a painting where you see everything at the same time. A novel is a journey that runs from one letter to another, from one point to another, and it takes time before everything has been said along that way. From the beginning to the end, all this desire for everything must be opened and displayed at full intensity. And the way from the first point to the last must contain different levels of moods, days, nights, shadows, experiences that in thin layers stalked upon each other suddenly can make the experience of life or at least the idea of life or if you want to describe it as durastu as this everything so in my writing i have tried to write the experience of motherhood but how to do it? I still ask the question almost every day. How to say everything about the wonderful and composite experience of being a mother? About the experience of having a child? About being so intimately connected to another person as you are with your child? I also want to say it all about being a mother of children whose biological mothers have gone by my side for almost half of my life. Women whose faces I have never seen but perceived every day in my children's faces. Women who I, in many ways, are responsible for. And I also wanted to write that the experience of having a child also contains the fact that I am someone's child, even I have a mother, and that a motherhood always contains the child's experiences of both light and darkness, both tenderness and distance, and all of the other contradictory connections between parents and children. My latest book, Carrying the Child Home is divided in two parts, one fictional and one biographical. The fictional Anna is an orphan Colombian woman who grew up with nuns in a monastery in the mountains. She has never experienced a mother. Now she works as a nanny in a well-managed family in Bogota and develops develops a very close relationship with the baby boy, Matteo. In the other story, the biographical narrator travels with her adult adopted son for the first time to meet his biological mother, a mother who he has found through Facebook. This is a trip I did a couple of years ago with my own son, a journey, of course, intrigued by many thoughts and questions about what it means to be a mother, about the ties that connect mother and child, and how the meeting with the unknown mother might change both what has been our family and what was going to become our family after this meeting. The journey, of course, also triggered the horror of losing the child, the old horror that differs from the newborn infant's survival cry to the grown-up son's deep will to become on, become on his own. The book also contains the story of my own mother, who, during the preparation for this trip, is slowly disappearing into her aging, with Alzheimer's disease, 
where the testimony of my childhood and about me as a child gets buried forever. This two-parted book was, of course, an attempt to write about maternity in a much wider and deeper way than just talking about myself, my children and my feelings. And I'm so sad that it's not available, neither in English or Turkish, so you could judge if I succeed or not. However, it is important to remember that fiction always has the unique advantage of seriously speaking of reality without ever being accused of lying. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> hello. I'm also very grateful for being here. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and my writing. Uh, in Sweden, as you have been told, I work as an author and radio host and a playwright. I've written 10 novels and some children's books. Um, somebody wrote about my books that they deal with the extreme amount of complication that is significant for close relationship between family members. And when I read that, I thought, oh yes, that's me, that's my mission, to write about this extreme kind of complication. As an example, what I mean with this kind of relationships, I tell you a short story. I once made an interview on stage with a well-known child psychiatrist who worked, she was from Canada, I think, she worked with very uh, hard, very tra tra traumatized children. Uh, she was a real specialist. She talked about her work, so smart, so secure. Uh, but after a while, while, I asked her about her private life. Um, you have a daughter, I said. Uh, how does that work, being a mother yourself? And she just stared at me and she said, oh, that's so complicated. So hard, I don't know what to do sometimes. And I never forget that, that thing. I always keep thinking about that because I think it's something very special with this close relationship. You can be a very secure and you know what to do in, with other people, but when it comes to those one you really love, it gets very complicated. Um, I, in my book, I almost, uh, in every book, in almost every book, uh, they deal about this kind of fam family relationships. They deal about uh, family crisis, divorce, infidelity, parenthood, love, all those things that in a more patriarch context is seen as banal topics. But we all know that it's the most important things in life. It's just some men that don't get it. And if they write about it, it's more often described as, as an existential drama, not banal at all. Sometimes I feel it feels like women don't have existential dramas or crises. That's something men has. So now I want to tell you I write about existential dramas too. Um, what do you want in your life? How could you get all the parts together? Me, as an author, author, I start every book thinking this should be something completely different than the ones I wrote before. But I always notice I come back to the same subjects as before. Usually there's someone disappearing or missing in the family, somebody gets lost, somebody leaves. When I was a child in Sweden, I saw a lot of TV series about cowboys. It was the Bonanza family, the family of High Chaparral, the McKeon family. I don't know if you have seen them here in Turkey. Uh, as a child, I loved cowboys, and I was very impressed by their kind of freedom. They just right away, I totally identified myself with them. I wanted a life like that. 
Um, and if a woman come, came along and begged them to stay, I just thought, oh, of course not. Uh, I have this freedom to take care of. Years later, when I was a teenager and a young, or a young adult, I read authors like Erika Jong and Susanna Bregger, a Danish writer, uh, and Swedish writers like Kerstin Thorvald and Inger Alvén. And they were all examples of a kind of feminist writers that had a great impact on women at that time. Often they described marriage, marriages and relationships that were all in the terms of the husband or boyfriend and the female character in the book made a dramatic and tempting breakup from this family condition where they couldn't feel as free individuals. For me, it was a kind of romantic feeling of breaking up, not very unlike the cowboy situation. But your life can, can't just be a series of breaking up situation. Love comes in the way. You can't be on a horseback all your life. You can't always use breaking up as a problem solver. So I think my stories is about the existential balancing act between feeling free as an individual, living your life in a way that you want, and that you have your own destiny in your own hand. And, and this is important, also to be able to love, to be devoted, to be needing, because that is what love is about. It's not easy to bring these two needs in, together, in working together in your life, the need of independence and the need of intimacy and being dependent on the ones you love. I think that most, that's what my book, books are about in a wider concept, that kind of struggle. In Sweden you write what you want, you have laws on your side uh, that support the freedom of speech. The obstacles is more inside you. As a female author, one of the things I've been asking myself is if the portrait of women are too weak or make too many stupid choices. Like I'm banned to portray strong female heroines, but I rather try to describe them in a more realistic way. They can be lying, they can be jealous or ambitious, they can be unfaithful, they can do things a good mother doesn't do it at all. But I think they have one thing in common, they struggle. They really try hard, although they may choice wrong ways or do not, do not achieve their goals. My latest novel is called in Swedish, De Dombehövande. I guess you can translate it to something like The Needing Ones. I don't know, something like that. Anyway, it's about a mother in her late 60s and a daughter in her 30s. And the, this daughter have two small children, a boy three years old and a daughter of one. It's about their feelings and communications between them. Um, uh, yes. Um, They have, uh, I don't know if you, they, they, the mother and the children, the mothers, that kind of relation is so, you don't know where the other one, you, a mother, you, a mother and a daughter is coming from a kind of relationship where you don't know when one begins and the other ends. You're part of the same body in the beginning. And it, I think it's got a kind of influence on the way you communicate. For example, uh, uh, it's a limit, limitless kind of relation. You also want literally the same body. The mother in this book is thinking like this. I never say that I think you let your children getting everything they want in their own way. I never say anything about that. The thing is that she does not need to. The daughter knows exactly what the mother thinks about her way with the children. And sometimes she goes crazy just about knowing her mother is thinking so. And the daughter also thinks at one point that could you be 
mother to change the expression of her face because it really gets on her nerves that she looks at her, the, the way she looks. I mean, it's the way they behave together is so limitless. So it, you just look at each other and think, I know exactly what you think. It drives me crazy. Could you please look in an hour? <laughs> looking in the other way. And they also have these kind of speeches with, uh, in between themselves, like um, when, the, when the daughter is really angry with the mother, she has this speech in her head telling her everything she thinks and so. And the, do, the mother does the same thing, and they have these speeches to each other, but they never really talk about it in the open. Um, <clears throat> loving is not easy. Although you love and need one another, in the end, the mother thinks about her daughter like this. Loving you is the, mo is the most easy thing in the world. But I don't know anything more difficult than knowing how to. So that's something that occupies me as an author, knowing how to. Two. Oh, that's something about me. That's not. <laughs> no. Sorry. Um, çok teşekkür ederiz. Bu güzel incelikli konuşmalar için. Ee, siz anlatırken aklıma şey geldi. Yani kadın yazısı çok otobiyografik algılanır. Ee, Silla biraz zaten hani kendi deneyimi üzerinden yazdığını söyledi. Ee, peki bu hani kendini bu kadar açık etmek ya da her defasında otobiyografik yani otobiyografik bir şey yazıyorsanız kendinizi bu kadar açık etmekle ilgili ne hissediyorsunuz? Ee, yazmasanız dahi böyle algılanması ile ilgili ne hissediyorsunuz? Yani ne yazsanız sanki kendi hakkınızda yazıyormuşsunuz gibi, kendi aile hikayeleriniz üzerine yazıyormuşsunuz gibi. Ee, nasıl bir şey bu yani? Hani ne yazsanız kendiniz üzerineymiş gibi. Böyle sorularla karşılaşıyor musunuz? Um, no, I try to, in my speech, I, I think I try to explain that uh, everything is not autobiographical and that I have written this book, the, my latest book was uh, parted into two and um, that one part was um, autobiographical and that is the only thing I have written in that way in my whole life. So everything else I have written is uh, fiction and um, a female writer always um, risk, had a, there is a risk that you um, mixed up her work with her life and I think it's a it's a big problem, and it's, uh, it's something that you have to deal with as a female writer. So, um, that I am so open with my life when I talk about it, uh, as I did today, it, um, it does not mean that I am writing about my life all the time. I think it's better that I tell the story as this, and then um, I, I think I am very, very interesting in fictional writing. Uh, I often get the question, is this your life you're writing about? And I will usually answer that, that I write fiction to be, to be true. I think if I didn't write fiction, I couldn't be 
telling the truth, because then I had to make things a little more better than they are, maybe, or I, I think about, oh, what would, would this person say, and so on. But in, a, in one way, it's, of course, it's about me. I, I used to say that it's like, I don't know if you have this, in Sweden, when we were children, we had these doll houses with little dolls, and then you played with them. And I said, oh, my, my books are my doll houses, so it's about me, and it's about, but it's fiction. It's fiction, it's <laughs> true fiction. I believe in, in, in fiction. <laughs> And um, yes, so um, yeah, that's the answer. Um, but it, you all very often get this question. I very often get this question. Is this about you? Is it about your life? So of course it's about me, but maybe I'm the man in the story or the grandmother in the story. And, I, and with Flaubert's word, I'm everybody. <laughs> Yani her ikiniz de konuşmanızda değindiniz. Hani annelik deneyiminin böyle karanlık yerleri üzerine de yazdığınızı. Ama zaten başlı başına hani bana öyle geliyor ki kadın hayatı üzerine yazmak çok tabuyla dolu bir şey. İşte kadın bedeni, kadının yaşlanması meselelerini üzerine yazmak da çok tabu. Ee, bu İsveç'te de böyle mi? Yani e, ve bu tabularla nasıl baş ediyorsunuz birer yazar olarak? I don't think it's taboo to write about uh, female um, bodies or female aging or something in Sweden, but there is a taboo writing about your own children and your own mother. So um, it is very, very important to to um, um, to find a way of writing that you that the audience don't mix up your life with your book. And so, for me as an author, I have to find a way of uh, writing that. That where I can feel free, so um, and uh, still write about these topics, and that's um, that's a big work to find a way of writing it uh, to be true. Uh, for me, the taboos is more uh, considering the life of the ones close to me. So I don't care about the audience if I'm very personal. It's more about my private relations that I want to be careful about. And uh, that's what I mean really about fiction, that you can, if you choose to write fiction, then you can make stories that are true. And you don't have to think about people in your surroundings, there are people that are close to you. So I don't think in Sweden we have, I, I, I don't feel any taboos, but I sometimes felt that you have to, that you want to describe women in a good way or a political right way. So I don't want to, I don't want to describe heroines, but I want to describe female character with a death and a struggle, and as well with too many, so many layers that you can, because it's a problem that women in fiction, either it's literature or film, or yes, it's they got very. <laughs> a more flat layer or single layer than many others. So, so that's very important for me. I mean, they could be good or they could be bad, but I think it's very important that they get a complex structure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Sorry. Bir de şeyi merak ediyorum ben yani bir hani kadın yazar olmanın bir de somut hani zorlukları var ee, iki düzeyde herhalde bir hani yayın piyasasına girmek Türkiye'de erkeklerin çok domine ettiği bir piyasa bu ee, iki bir de kendine ait bir oda meselesi yani koca bir hayat kotarmaya çalışırken yazmaya vakit ayırabilmek kendine dönebilmeye vakit ayırabilmek hani yazmak bir yana artı bir de yetmezmiş gibi yazmaya vakit ayırabilmek ee, bu yayın piyasası ve cinsiyet meselesi İsveç'te nasıl hani bir zorluk yaşıyor musunuz kadın yazar olarak ve kendine ait bir odayı nasıl yarattınız um. I think uh, I think uh, writers all over the world uh, struggles with the economic issues. So <laughs> it, it's the same in Sweden, uh, but maybe it's easier uh, to find another work to support yourself. Uh, and um, I think it's what we have done, both of us. We are friends in privacy too, and we have we have salute. We have made the same solution. We have worked as journalists for for uh, earning money, and then we have um, uh, we have written as authors on on the besides. So, so that's a very common way to to solve your life in Sweden, and I think it's the same all over the world. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it's some sort of dream to have a big audience to and to sell a lot of books, but. I don't do. Helena sells a lot of more books than I do. <laughs> um, oh, I forgot. <laughs> what I, yes, um, this room of your own, it's something you need to create, not only just in a physical way, but also in your mind. And I live with an author, and uh, I think he's has much. He, he has something about taking his place to make his write his novels that I lack myself. For me, it's just children were smaller; they just came to me and asked things, and I just. And it, I think it's, it's something you have to create on your own, and it's. Um, I don't know why my work shouldn't be that important, but I think many times I think about that. Why do I have so hard for creating in a psychology way more, psychologic way more, uh, to have this room of my own? It's like I really can't make myself that important, I guess. Uh, but it's getting better. <laughs> for me, for me, I started write uh, fiction when I got my first child, and and uh, I think that was a, it was a fantastic uh, time in my life to to turn uh, my concentration into the small life, uh, to have a little baby, and you can. Uh, for some months you can try to forget the world and just uh, concentrate you inside. So that was a great beginning for me to, to write uh, my own texts. Bir de ben hani son bir soru daha sorup sizlere şey yapacağım, sözü vereceğim soru sormak isteyenlere. Ee, ya bat, Batı dışı edebiyatta bir şey var. Ee, çok politik bir yükü var her zaman edebiyatın. Ee, böyle en e, mahrem konularda yazsanız dahi gene de böyle, aslında tüm bir ulusa konuşuyorsunuz her defasında. Ee, hele ki böyle daha politik gerilimin arttığı şimdiki dönemler gibi dönemlerde ee, bu daha da derinleşiyor. 
Dolayısıyla hani Türkiye'de kadın ya da erkek ama kadın olunca politik bir laf etmeknin başka bir yükü oluyor tabii. Hani tüm yazarlarda böyle bir edebiyatın kuytusuna çekilmek, e, onun serinliğinden de faydalanmak, hani sadece yazının kendisinden ibaret olduğu bir hani dünyadan yazmak falan e, algılanması nedeniyle zor yazdığınız şeylerin hani bu İsveç ya yani dolayısıyla hani Türkiye'de edebiyat böyle bu feminizmin e, kişisel olan politik ile çok dolu e, İsveç'te nasıl bu ve hani e, hem feminist politika hem de kadın yazısı açısından soruyorum yani e, bu durum <gülüyor> Anlatabildim mi? <gülüyor> um, I guess uh, in Sweden we have a tendency of making more politic today in private issues, I think, than we had before. Because we have this kind of uh, populist movement in Sweden too. So uh, there often, you know, it, it, it, uh, it, politics gets in the way all the time, or very often. And it could be like uh, you read sometimes that uh, somebody says that priests in Sweden are more left wing because they talk about Jesus being somebody who <laughs> helped refugees. Very strange things to say, I guess. But so, so you see politics in in every way. If you try to, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's a kind of right wing uh, populist movement in Sweden, in my opinion, that goes uh, that way, and everything that's helping people or feminism and all that is some kind of leftish bullshit, maybe. So. <laughs> but it's also, of course, a, a strong movement in Sweden um, with, uh, for example, Me Too. So uh, uh, there is a lot of um, um, discussions. Um, what what uh, what can literature? Uh, means for for the those kind of moments uh, homosexual bisexual me too harassments uh, yeah, all these things what um, what do the literature says about this how how do literature help women how and so on so it's a, it's um, it's always uh, literature it's always uh, something that have to discuss those topics and uh, it's also a discussion that contains this kind of questions. I agree. <laughs> Peki salondan sorular var mıdır? Ben şeyi merak ediyorum. Bugün bir annelik motherhood oturumumuz vardı. Sanki bu söyleşi bir şekilde önceden acaba gerçekten bu konuyu yazan yazarlarla bir araya gelelim gibi bir şey mi oldu? Böyle bir sürpriz şey geldi bana. Bir dakika biz motherhood daha sonraki oturum değil miydi? Burada pek bir Buna ağırlık veren iki yazarla beraberiz. Aslında muhteşem bir şey oldu. Kadınlar bu konuda tabii ki çok dertlerini var. Çok birbirlerini anlamak ihtiyacındalar. Ama genellikle annelik çok fazla bizim yazınımızda, kadın yazısında çok fazla değinilen bir konu değil. 
e, hani böyle bir düşünce var mıydı sizin kafanızda? Hani bugüne özel e, böyle iki yazar yoksa bu bir tamamen sürpriz mi oldu? Merak ettim. Yani e, öyle sanıyorum ki hani annelik oturumunda konuşacak yazarlar İsveç edebiyatından biraz bize böyle bir e, hani esinti olsun birazcık tanıyalım diye de hazır buradayken bir araya gelelim gibi bir fikir vardı. E, ama işte o oturum için çağrılınca ve kadın yazısı üzerine konuşunca ister istemez oraya da gitti yani ve bir giriş oldu aslında iyi oldu evet. böyle bir şey vardı böyle bir eğilim vardı öyle mi? yani bu yazarlar evet yani bu konuda o zaman çağrıldı evet. ve burada bir tanımlar oldu bir sürü we, we, we can't hear you right now No, I said that uh, Helena and Sila were invited to speak for the uh, for the panel, and that this uh, was an opportunity also to uh, get to know them as authors. And of course, in the subject, I think, like Sila said, I mean, uh, she described what she is writing about, and I think it's close to maybe motherhood, but not only motherhood. And I think it's an opportunity to. Um, also find out about women writers in Sweden and ask questions around that. But it was like a pre-introduction also to the next panel that also will take place, okay. I think. If that answered yes. That's your sorry. question. But we will move on and find out more, and also maybe find out more uh, from a perspective, of, from a Turkish perspective, because that's always interesting when you add on experiences from both sides. I think. I have a question, but I keep it for the next. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs>